What's up guys, Coach Az here. Today, I thought we would take a look at fighter intangibles. Things that, whether it be through your genetics, or just the way you're born, or maybe something that happened to you in your upbringing as a child, they are attributes that you have that you might be able to use as an advantage in a fight that you don't necessarily have much control over. Or it might be an attribute that you see someone with and you admire it and you want to emulate it, but in reality, it's not something that you can simply attain through training, at least not completely. We're also going to talk about what you can do if you lack in certain areas, if you wanted to build some of these attributes, and if you're dealing with someone who has them. So let's go straight into it with number one. Number one really is genetics, and that is your limb length, your reach. Now, this applies regardless of martial art, whether you're a boxer and it's the reach of your arm, whether you're a kickboxer and you've got to take into consideration the reach of your legs, and even as a grappler, having longer or shorter limbs or a longer or shorter torso is going to affect the way you approach fighting. Generally speaking, we call it a reach advantage. So people like John Jones in the UFC benefit from this huge long reach and it allows them to attack their opponents from further away. It means that they're at a range where they can kick you and they can punch you, but realistically, you can't kick or punch them back. So it provides an advantage because you have to work that little bit harder to get in on these people. And I can speak from experience, I've fought a lot of people with far longer limbs than me. I've got a terrible genetic makeup when it comes to these things. I have a relatively long torso, I have a relatively long neck, and I have very short and stumpy legs and arms considering my height. I'm six foot tall, so I'm pretty tall. I'm you know above average height for a guy. I'm relatively slender in my frame, and it means I generally come up with people and they're about the same height as me. I fight people the same height as me, I train with people the same height as me, but more often than not, they've got the longer arm. So although I might even be a bit taller than them, I always need to work harder to get on the inside in order to deal with them. Now, if you're blessed with this intangible, then you wanna make sure that you take advantage of it. You wanna work on your long range techniques. You wanna work on being able to keep people at bay and be able to maintain and manage the distance so that you can frustrate your opponents. If you're dealing with someone who has this attribute or you lack it personally or a shorter fighter or like me, shorter limbed, you need to work on your ability to get on the inside. I'm talking in particular about stand-up, that's my wheelhouse. I'm sure in grappling it applies in different ways in terms of how you can approach submissions, what you need to be aware of in terms of exposing your arm or exposing your leg to an opponent, how you can switch up and change positions. There's obviously nothing you can truly do about it in terms of you can't change the length of your arms and legs without very evasive, very strange surgery that I obviously don't recommend. But you can work on your ability to get better at understanding your range, understanding your reach and fighting well within it. Number two is power. Power is one of these mad, mad things. You can obviously develop it and work on it and you certainly should but some people just have it. I'll give you an example. One of my coaches, if you were to look at him, so if you were to step in the ring with him, kickboxing bout, and he took his shirt off, and you took your shirt off, you would think of him as no one you needed to worry about in terms of his power. You'd think possibly has a good gas tank, possibly is a bit scrappy, maybe he has good technique, but I don't need to worry about taking a big shot. And you'd be completely wrong. The guy is built a bit like a beanstalk. He's got skinny arms, skinny legs. He's not got a particularly large amount of muscle tone. His technique's not the most beautiful. I love the guy, but his technique's not the most beautiful. But the man has crazy power in his hands. And it's inexplainable. We don't train him for it. He's never particularly focused or worked on it. He just has a predisposition for heavy hands. He just has the ability to land that power shot. And again, we see this with freaks of nature like Francis Ngannou and other people. I'm using the UFC because I think most of you will understand what I'm talking about when I mention these names. These people just have access to more power than you could ever hope to. 
But like I said, it is something that you can work on and develop. Some real great ways for developing more power, especially in a striking realm, is to work on a heavy bag. By heavy, I mean a bag that barely even swings or moves when you hit it. This added resistance and this added resistance to what you're throwing at it will help you to develop more power in your strikes. And of course, including a good strength and conditioning routine that focuses around power movements, compound lifts, heavy lifts for low reps, this is the kind of thing that's gonna help you be able to develop your own natural power. Now, you won't have the same threshold as some people, but you can still maximize your own personal potential for it. Number three is the gas tank, the ability to sustain yourself over and throughout the fight. And again, very simple in terms of how we build up and develop our gas tank. We all know you got to get those miles in, go for those runs. You got to do those rounds of skipping rope. You got to do those bag work rounds, pad work rounds, sparring rounds. You got to spend time working on your cardiovascular system. But some people just have a genetic predisposition to be able to go longer and harder than others. Tony Ferguson, Max Holloway, these guys made a whole career out of the idea of putting pressure on people and maintaining a pace that their opponent couldn't match or couldn't sustain for the same length of time. I do believe that this is partly psychological, that they have this ability to shut off that part of their brain that tells them that they're tired and are just able to muscle through that in a way that other people aren't. I believe they get tired, they get gas, they experience it, but they just have a way of separating themselves from it psychologically. If you're trying to develop your gas tank more, one of the things I'd really say that you need to start including if you're not ready is hill sprints and interval training. Anything that pushes you through all the different energy systems that we use for martial arts training. What you need to keep in mind with martial arts is it's not necessarily a sprint and it's not necessarily a marathon. It's a bit of a hybrid of both. You've got moments where we're flowing, we're moving, we're light on our feet, we're showing our fakes like a marathon runner. We're just pacing it, getting through the rounds. Fights are normally 15, 20 minutes. It's quite a long time to engage in sport. That's not a sprinting distance. However, we have moments of explosivity. When you attack, when you have to counter, when you have to sprawl, when you have to change position, these things require that sudden burst of anaerobic energy. So including exercises in your routine that work through all these different energy systems is what's really gonna help develop your gas tank throughout the spectrum. It's all well and good being a cardio machine, you can run a long time, and it's all well and good being a solid sprinter, but you need to have a little bit of both. Number four is your chin, your ability to take a shot. I am always fascinated by this because I am well aware that I don't have much of a chin, never have, never really wanted to. I never wanted to be known as someone who could take punches. I don't think that's a great way to be going around. I don't like the idea of being a zombie who can take loads of headshots. It's not good for you. But I have always admired and always wondered how some fighters are able to take so much punishment, in particular to the head, without getting knocked out or even dazed and rocked on their feet. And again, I do think part of this comes down to genetics. When I talk about myself, like I said, I've got a very long neck, so it creates quite a long lever. When I get hit in the head, my head tends to move a lot more. I've noticed a lot of people who have a great chin tend to not have a neck. Shoulders straight into head, less movement, less rattling of the brain, less issues when it comes to things like getting concussed. Now, a lot of people, I see them recommending doing things like neck exercises. It's never anything that I've included in my training or promoted for any of my fighters. I think the jury is still out on how beneficial it truly is in terms of making you stronger or making you more durable for taking headshots as opposed to possibly damaging the vertebrae and damaging your neck and shrinking your career in the long term. My advice to any of you that are similar to me or don't even want to figure out if you've got a good chin is to work on your defensive abilities. Work on your head movement, work on your guard, work on your footwork. Don't be the guy who gets hit. Be the guy who throws the shot, who does the hitting. And number five is heart. That ability to just keep going when things get tough, when things get difficult. And this one, although I'm sure there is a bit of a genetic marker in it, I really think it comes down to life experience. I think if you've gone through difficulties in life, if you've gone through challenges and you've come out the other side and you've done that repeatedly throughout your life, including early on in childhood, 
This helps you to develop a really strong sense of heart, that ability to push through adversity. This is why we see so many feel-good stories of fighters that have come from really humble beginnings or really difficult traumatic backgrounds and have made it to the highest of heights in combat sports. A lot of this comes down to the fact that they've already been through the struggles. You think it's hard to get punched in the head? For them, that's just a Friday night. So they've got this ability to go somewhere in themselves to dig that little bit deeper than the majority of people out there. Now, do you have to have had a traumatic childhood experience in order to have heart? Definitely not. The biggest thing in terms of developing your heart is to work on your why. Why do you train? Why are you competing? Why are you putting those gloves on? Why are you stepping on the mat? Why are you stepping in the ring or the cage? If you have a good understanding of your why, the purpose, the reason why you're doing it, that's what's going to propel you forward. A great example of where someone has developed more heart than previous is when they have children. When suddenly, instead of just trying to feed your own mouth, you now have to feed and provide for a child, that gives you a larger why. And we've all experienced that, or any of you that have had children would have experienced that in terms of how it changes your predisposition or your approach to your work, to making money, to ensuring that you can support and look after your family. Your why has become so much bigger than just yourself and looking after you. It becomes about looking after others. So next time you're struggling to even leave the door to go to training or you're in training and you just can't seem to push yourself forward, try to take a moment to reflect on your why and that's going to help push your heart, your head and your soul forward. Guys, I hope you found this video interesting. If you have, I'd really appreciate it if you hit that like button, hit subscribe. We've got new videos coming out every week and I will see you on the next one. Yeah.